Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to BookTube at War. This is a BookTube event uh, debuting in 2023. It was dreamt up by a viewer, DDB, uh, and it was morphed into a BookTube event by Michael K. Vaughn, who assembled a great crew of BookTubers to talk about military fiction, military nonfiction, military memoirs, the infiltration into literature of war in all of its aspects, in all of its... Uh, its tempers and tenors. I think this is just a fascinating idea. I'm so glad that it exists now. I've been reading military tinge stuff of one kind or another forever. And, you know, not, not to be all doomy and gloomy, but mankind has been writing military themed stuff, fiction, nonfiction, poetry forever as well. It's percolated into virtually every kind of artistic expression that humans have. And that's just as well, because today we'll be dealing with a comic book. <laughs> because in addition to Booktube at War, which is just going on for the month of July, I am also part of a Booktube collaboration with Michael K. Vaughn uh, of Epic Comic Book Wednesday, where we talk about comic books every Wednesday. And the most famous comic book war of the modern era, the Stan Lee era, is this. The Cree Skrull War. <laughs> this is a, an old Marvel's finest uh, trade paperback collection of issues from the 1970s, with a an original Neil Adams cover. Uh, three cows shot me down. That is an almost intangible vision, pleading for help from the three signature Avengers. There, they're all standing really weird. The cover is really weird. This is just this is just a weird Neil Adams cover, but very striking. And when you read the storyline, you understand exactly where this comes from. And this collects a whole bunch of Avengers issues from the 1970s, written by Roy Thomas and drawn by uh, Sal Buscema, his brother John Buscema, and Neil Adams. This, this same artist did these 50 years ago. Uh, and it revolves around two alien species that were introduced offhandedly by Stan Lee in Fantastic Four comics. Just... When he, when Stanley needed a gimmick, one thing that he uh, that he held over from Monster Comic days, when he needed a gimmick, he would invent a cosmology, just an entirely new cosmology, use it for that gimmick, and then toss it aside. It wasn't until you get continuity wonks that you people start to wonder, well, how do all those different pieces fit together? And Stanley introduced a race of super beings called the Skrull literally little green men, who could shapeshift. They could change their form at will. And they fight the Fantastic Four, and they are dealt with, and they are frozen in the form of cows and pastured, uh, I guess, in upstate New York. Hence the cover here. Uh, but Stanley also introduced the Kree, a, a humanoid, a alien, spacefaring alien species that came to Earth a long time ago and meddled around in certain populations of humans' genetics, a la Chariots of the Gods. And Roy Thomas came up with the idea of what, what, is, what is the relationship, not between the Skrull and the Fantastic Four, or the Kree and the Inhumans, the group of characters, that, the group of humans that the Kree genetically manipulate are the Inhumans, but what's their relationship instead with each other? And Roy Thomas imagined that the Skrull Empire and the Kree Empire have been at war forever, for a long, long time. He has a character, uh, put it well, in, in one of these issues. Let me see if I, can, if I can quickly find it. One of the key characters in all of these issues is a character that uh, Roy Thomas adapted. He sort of, he took the name of Captain Marvel from Fawcett Comics and then DC Comics, it, it, and uh, Marvel wanted to own that name. So they, come up, they had to come up with a character to call Captain Marvel. And uh, I guess a kind of attempt was made, a stranded alien on Earth, a member of the Kree who was raised a loyal man of the Kree, he was raised a, royal, a loyal soldier, and he turns his back on his empire and is stranded on Earth and has the usual suite of vague can do anything that you want, superpowers and super technology. But at one point, he's telling uh, the character Carol Danvers. It gives you an idea of how long ago the Kree-Skrull War came out. This was back in the days when Carol Danvers was still a woman. 
And he says to her at one point, war across a thousand worlds whose names they scarcely knew. Intergalactic war over countless light centuries of distance. That is a, a thumbnail description of the war between the Kree and the Skrull, and it evokes a massive long-standing fight uh, on a galactic scale, an intergalactic scale, and we don't get that in this story. It's important to understand that the kree Skrull War does not give us the kree Skrull War at all. Instead, Roy Thomas imagined if there were this massive intergalactic war between giant spacefaring empires, then Earth, which doesn't even have a space fleet, doesn't have it doesn't even have one government, would be a backwater, less than a backwater. It would be almost nothing. He imagined it, Roy Thomas imagined it, he used to say in interviews that he imagined it as a tiny Pacific island, an atoll in the Pacific, during World War II, where you would have massive forces with technology that you can't even comprehend that might war over you for a day or an afternoon, but you would never be central to the conflict. One of the chapters in this story is called This Beachhead Earth. Uh, and on a couple of different levels, the kree Skrull War does not have the courage of its convictions. Now, I'm not faulting Roy Thomas for that, because I'm sure that nobody would rather have written the story that he envisioned than he did. It just he couldn't do it, because that, as the description that I just gave uh, indicates, that would barely involve the Avengers. It would barely involve the Fantastic Four at all. The, instead, the kree Skrull War has to be a backdrop to stories that will float these issues. So on one level, he doesn't have the courage of his convictions because this is not the kree Skrull War. We get, uh, Neil Adams especially gives us one panel here. We get terrific stuff. Terrific space stuff. But this is still a superhero story. And on the there's another way in which the kree Skrull War does not have the courage of its convictions, which is that originally, as originally I envisioned, Roy Thomas was thinking, uh, exactly what I just described, that Earth is a small footnote, less than a footnote, in an intergalactic war between massive empires who've been fighting for centuries. That would be great. That would be a terrific story. But it wouldn't work as a comic book story. And so the second way in which this doesn't have the courage of its convictions is that eventually the story does revolve around Earth. <laughs> and not only Earth, but a character that we have seen on Epic Comic Book Wednesday a few times and mocked every time, at least I have, Rick Jones. The ultimate nobody-wants-me loser sidekick. <laughs> it was some sort of loser teen sidekick for the Hulk. He was a loser teen sidekick for the Avengers. He was even a loser teen sidekick for Captain America, who in the one of the creepiest storylines in Marvel history trained Rick Jones to be Bucky, to be Captain America's teenage sidekick during World War II who died. At least Captain America thinks he's dead. Captain America, somehow he orders Rick Jones a Bucky uniform and trains him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. There are issues, a number of them, where Rick Jones wears Bucky's costume, complete with domino mask, and Captain America and Bucky are a team again. When this is a Captain America who is undergoing long-term PTSD and who n believes that his, he led his teenage sidekick in World War II to his death. Duh! <laughs> it's, just, it's not examined at all. That went all through the 70s, and it's not examined at all. Uh, plus, Rick Jones never puts on any muscle. He never seems to have any tone. He never seems to be anything but a twerp, or to use the favorite word in these issues, a stripling. <laughs> the Skrull refer to Rick Jones throughout these issues as a stripling. The Kree refer to Rick Jones throughout these issues as a stripling. Thor refers to Rick Jones throughout these issues as a stripling. Roy Thomas's narration boxes throughout these issues, refer to Rick Jones as a stripling. The Fantastic Four refers to Rick Jones as a stripling. Annihilus refers to Rick Jones as a stripling. They all use the same word. <laughs> the guy's got some sort of complex. <laughs> but uh, he's in this story inexplicably. 
And the reason why he's in this story, actually, it's not inexplicably, it's just lamentable, is that for a while, the Roy Thomas's revamp of Captain Marvel wanted to, not only to steal that name from DC Comics and Fawcett Comics, not only to make it so that the creator, the company that made Captain Marvel can't use that name anymore, they have to call him Shazam, but also to rub salt in the wound because this could be a pretty mean industry when it wasn't being friendly, when the creators weren't getting together in Central Park for a baseball game, they could be pretty mean to each other. And so, for a while, one of the aspects of the revamp of Marvel's Captain Marvel, the Kree warrior, Marvel, was that when he slams his nega band energy bracelets together, he swaps places with Rick Jones, who's otherwise floating in the negative zone, the home of Annihilus, who calls him a stripling. <laughs> in other words a Marvel science tech-oriented version of Billy Batson saying his magic word, where only one of them can appear at the same time, where they, they swap places with each other, and there's a thing that, that, that you know the boy has to do in order to become the man. <laughs> so that's why Rick Jones is involved here. Because naturally, uh, Marvell is involved here. He's, he's, he is our anchor to the Cree world. He's, he's the, the face of the Kree. He's an exiled Kree on Earth. The colorists in these issues can't decide whether he has silver hair or blonde hair. And the writer can't decide what it is that Captain Marvell can do. What is it that he can do? I mean, he, he, does, he has greater strength than a normal human being. He can leap greater distances than a normal human being. But the parameters are wide open. Uh, let me give you... Let me give you a, an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, at one point, uh, Captain Marvel steals uh, an Avengers aircraft. Uh, seems to know how to pilot it. He wants to steal it and take it to... Uh, here, let me see. Let me see here. He wants to steal it. He steals a, an aircraft from the Fantastic Four. He gets to the Baxter building and uh, realizes that he, he thought that he was going to be able to easily master the technology in the Baxter building because he's from a super sophisticated scientific race. But in a very neat nod uh, to the genius of Reed Richards, the leader of the Fantastic Four, he can't understand any of the technology. It's far more advanced than either of the Kree or the Skrull Empire. But he manages to steal a craft. He doesn't check the gas gauge, so it runs out of gas when he's over the Everglades. And he's up here. And he leaps out of his craft. He says, I can't fly, but thanks to Earth's gravity, I can still leap. That's a long way. That's a mile or more. He manages to leap from that craft. I guess it crashes safely uh, without any harm at all which is enormous power. That is enormously powerful for someone to be like that. But uh, at another point, he has to force open elevator doors in the Baxter building, and he has a real hard time doing it. It's inch-thick metal, and he has a real hard time doing it. He destroys a potted plant, but it takes him a lot of effort. If you had the ability to jump out of a plane at a mile's distance from the ground, you wouldn't have any trouble doing this, unless your arms are magically weaker than your legs. Uh, and also, he has the nega bands on there, so why he doesn't blast the door, I don't know. He's a dumb character, is what I'm trying to say. Captain Marvel, Marvel's uh, copyright theft of Captain Marvel, is a dumb character. And nothing suits him better than his final moment, because Marvel decides to kill him. And the death of Captain Marvel is one of the greatest comic book stories ever told. But we don't get his death in this issue. Ooh, no. Instead, he deals with the Avengers. And gradually, they deal with the Kree and the Skrull, who are at war with each other. That war doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The Kree are tough. They're militaristic. They're human. Humanoid. They look just like humans. Uh, but the Skrull are shapeshifters. So every Skrull has a superpower that would make that Skrull unbeatable against any Kree warrior or any ten Kree warriors. In addition to that, the Skrull have also genetically engineered uh, a being called the Super Skrull, 
who was a villain in the Fantastic Four, who has all the powers of the Fantastic Four. The original Skrull villains that fight the Fantastic Four can mimic their appearance, but to mimic their powers, they have to use technology. They use a flame suit and a flying harness that no other Skrull uses. <laughs> they, you'd, you'd presume all of them would have flying harnesses, but no, it's just that one Skrull. To mimic the Fantastic Four, they use an exoskeleton or uh, strength enhancers to mimic the thing. They use technology to mimic the powers of Mr. Fantastic or the force field of the Invisible Girl. Uh, they use technology to do that, and when they're beaten, that, that technology doesn't help them. But the Skrull also create a, a being called the Super Skrull, who physically has those powers, which would make him completely unbeatable. He has the Invisible Girl's impenetrable force fields that he could put inside your head and expand them like a bomb going off. He has Mr. Fantastic's elastic ability. He has the Human Torch's ability to, f to hurl superheated plasma at the skin of his enemies. And he has the thing super strength and invulnerability, the ability to lift 85 tons. He's all at once. He can do all of those things at once. So he can turn invisible, heat himself to supernova heat, walk up to you when you can't see him, and punch your head off with, an 85, with 85 tons of strength behind an invisible fist surrounded by an invulnerable force field. It's, no one could possibly beat the Super Skrull. Everybody does. Even Spider-Man has beaten the Super Skrull, but no one actually could. And I've never heard a good explanation from any writer as to why the Skrull Empire doesn't have a million of them. They can make one. They can make more than one. Uh, but this, in, until... Uh, much, 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 much later on, until just a few years ago, we never saw more than one at a time. Uh, in other words, the Skrull should win this war. It, it should have been over in a century, much less a thousand years, but it doesn't seem evenly matched to me at all. But we are led to believe, in the course of these issues, that the kree Skrull war is a fairly even thing. And even in one other way as well, one tragic way. There we have the Kree Supreme Intelligence, that's that guy, talking about the Kree versus the Skrull over the centuries. And he says, For untold eons, Skrull and Kree have stalked the cosmic corridors like twin races of malevolent gods, never knowing that each of their star-spanning clans had reached a dead end. Live a billion, billion years, neither will ever advance one more rung up the ladder of evolution. Now they can snarl at each other across the sea of space, hating both each other and the human race which they subconsciously sense to be their ultimate superiors. Uh, which is, that's great uh, artwork there, but that, of course, not how evolution works. That makes no sense whatsoever. Of course, of course, they would continue to evolve unless they've reached a point where they don't have any genetic variation in any generation. Uh, considering that the Skrull can shapeshift, I'm pretty sure that they're chock full of genetic variation. Uh, it's environment that makes you a genetic dead end, not your genetics, is, in other words, the point. <laughs> but the point that the supreme intelligence is trying to make at the end there is connected to what I was talking about, the, the, the lack of the courage of its convictions. Because in the end of this story, when the Avengers, the Avengers do engage in space battles, right out there like that, the, the, uh, the Skrull are amazed that two of these beings can operate in space unprotected. <laughs> they can operate in space without any kind of space gear. Uh, that's a, a point that's made over and over again when the Avengers have their various intergalactic adventures after this. This sort of set the mold for large-scale internet intergalactic adventures for comic books uh, in a good way. So, you know, kudos for that. And the fact that the Skrull and the Kree both notice that uh, Earth seems to produce these weird super beings, some of whom have drastically unignorable superpowers. There seems to be a lot of them. When we get the impression that, that is not true in the Skrull Empire or in the Kree Empire, uh, it's not until we get to uh, the Shi'ar in the X-Men, decades later, decades, a, a decade and a half after this, uh, that we have any hint that maybe the Shi'ar Empire has people that have superpowers. <laughs> Otherwise, no. Uh, and probably not all on one planet. Earth has a whole crew of these things, and that comes to the notice of everybody in these issues. From Ronan the Accuser, a great shouting, monologuing villain bad guy who crops up in here because he's a Kree, and he showed up when the Kree show up in the Fantastic Four originally, uh, to the Supreme Intelligence. Everyone notices 
that these beings seem to be all over the place on Earth. No one draws any fine distinctions about Thor. <laughs> Maybe they think he originated on Earth. Maybe he did. Never addressed. Uh, but at the end of the storyline, the thing that Roy Thomas wanted to do right from the beginning, before he knew any of the details of the Kree Skrull War, he had an image in mind, and it involved Rick Jones. It has to involve Rick Jones and not, for instance, Tony Stark or Steve Rogers. It has to involve an absolutely ordinary human. Now, I would argue that if you were at ground zero for a gamma ray bomb detonation and became the mysteriously unmutated sidekick of the Hulk, if you were the original boy mascot of the Avengers, uh, if you were Captain America's sidekick taking the place of his dead teenage sidekick Bucky, if you were changing your atoms with a Kree super soldier, you're probably not an average human. <laughs> you're, who knows what that's done to you? You're probably not. Rick Jones is probably not a normal human, but he is... Roy Thomas wanted a normal, average human for the climax of this story in which the Supreme Intelligence tells Rick Jones that unlike the Kree and the Skrull, humans have unbounded evolutionary potential. Uh, which manifests itself in the form of strange mental powers. <laughs> that is... That is uh, weird. <laughs> that is not, that is not, I won't, I don't want to keep repeating this line, but that is not how anything like this works. <laughs> Just not at all. This is not unbounded genetic potential. That is Rick Jones having mutant superpowers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not the human race, but, uh, the Cree, the Cree super the Supreme Intelligence has been manipulating events behind the scenes for the whole of the story we learn at the end. And one of the things that it seems to be able to do is unlock the full potential of Rick Jones's untapped evolutionary powers. And Rick Jones uses them to do something that Roy Thomas has been doing for the whole of his comic book career, figuratively. Bring the past to life. Because the Avengers need a little breathing space. The doors are being pounded on. Rick Jones is alone with the Supreme Intelligence. He has no power. He says, what do you think I've got? Thor's hammer up my sleeve? And the Supreme Intelligence says that uh, deep within your mind, you have memories of super beings as powerful or more so than the Avengers. They were comic books that you read as a boy. Roy Thomas read these comic books. If you use this untapped genetic power, you can bring them alive. And Rick Jones says something very interesting. He concentrates. He says, uh, Captain America and Prince Namor the Submariner are easy because they were real. Implying that the other characters were not. Of course, later on in comics, Roy Thomas and many other writers would say, all of these characters, of course, were real. Uh, it might be just that at this point, Rick Jones thinks they weren't. But he knows their adventures. He knows what they were like. And he summons them in the best panel of the whole of the Kree Skrull War. He summons them alive. You've got uh, the Patriot in his uh, short shorts. You've got the Blazing Skull. You've got the original Angel. Uh, you've got uh, Finn and uh, the original Vision. You've got Prince Namor in his red trunks. You've got uh, Captain America with no flag on his back. <laughs> uh, and they start just hammering these Kree warriors. They just lay into them. You've got the original Human Torch. Uh, the android, we're told. Uh, nor is it Johnny Storm who blazes forth this day, but the original android-bodied human torch. We have the original Vision, who's impervious to Kree blaster fire and can transport between dimensions. A little bit of dodgy coloring there. Uh, and uh, that saves the day. That you've got There you've got Ronan the Accuser uh, and his Kree minions. And... Uh, this saves the day. This impromptu super team is only around for a minute. Apparently, neither the Supreme Intelligence nor Rick Jones can sustain them for any longer than that or keep them alive permanently. Uh, that was the organizing moment of the Kree Skrull War, which tellingly had nothing to do with the Kree Skrull War. It had to do with just that panel. Let's look at that panel again, because that panel was the raison d'etre of this whole thing. <laughs> that, that right there. And that is amazing. Let me get you the uh, the cover. I, I didn't. I didn't. I had my uh, my comic book long boxes open just the other day, 
and this issue is sitting in there, and I didn't grab it. I didn't think ahead of time to book two, but war. But this is the great Gil Kane cover for that issue. I remember seeing this on the newsstand, and I couldn't pay my 20 cents fast enough because I recognized a lot of these characters. I, of course, you know the big three. That's Marvel's Trinity right there, their founding Trinity. This is their current Trinity, only Captain America being the same. You've got Thor, Captain America, and Iron Man. This was the original timely Trinity, the Submariner, the original Human Torch, and Captain America. But I noticed all of these others and thought, what on earth? Uh, and that deus ex machina, quite literally, I mean, that Roy Thomas always compared it to Athena being born full-blown from the head of Zeus, uh, that sort of saves the day. And things are wrapped up a little too neatly. Things are wrapped up so that the kree scroll war, although it may simmer on, no longer involves Earth. So we get a lot of intergalactic hijinks in here. There's what the we have our uh, our team of heroes fights against the Kree Sentry a couple of different times, and uh, the Sentry is the best character. <laughs> this always bothers me. Oh, that is great Salvo Schema artwork. That's just fantastic. Look at that. Look at the look at the, the panel composition here. That is just great. Uh, but the Sentry mops the floor with these three Avengers. The Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and the Vision. He mops the floor with them. Uh, it's a very weak core team that we have here. But uh, we also get Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne as uh, Yellow Jacket and uh, the Wasp. At one point, signaling things to come. Uh, let me show you here. Uh, at one point, Yellow Jacket and the Wasp are flying off to a secret base in Antarctica in order to explore what's going on, why does the, this base look so weird. And as Hank Pym, they're on a dragonfly flying in to look at it. And as they get closer, Hank Pym realizes something really strange is going on. And he wants to investigate, but he doesn't want to endanger Janet Van Dyne. He wants her to turn back. But he doesn't convince her to turn back. Instead... He belts her unconscious, <laughs> uh, which is a sign of things to come in the Avengers. You've got great stuff like that, great uh, intergalactic moments, some really bad covers. This is a really bad cover. Pretty much everybody is talking their head off. <laughs> this would have been a great cover all by itself. Uh, but instead, it's covered in uh, in dialogue. This This has some... Great big galactic moments like that, and also some really neat uh, smaller moments. Uh, this, for instance, the Kree Scroll War is the issue sequence when we learned that uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch are in love with each other, which is going to become a big, big deal about 20 issues after this. And also, this is the sequence, the, the sequence of issues when the Vision. Uh, is attacked by those scrawls in upstate New York in the shape of cows, and he barely makes it back to Avengers Mansion and then collapses. The Avengers have to find out what's wrong with him, and in order to do that, Hank Pym, as Ant-Man, returns to Avengers Mansion, shrinks down to ant size, and goes inside the Vision <laughs> in a visual tour de force uh, by Neil Adams. Just a, a visual, an amazing visual tour de force. That's surely the only reason why this issue even exists is to give us these page after page panel after panel of hank pym exploring the inner workings of the vision with a handy dandy ant-man jetpack that he never uses before and never uses after <laughs> uh this is i admit a signature amazing thing it is it is incredible artwork by neil adams we have uh, quite a bit of of terrific Neil Adams artwork. Let me get you another. There's another really great panel. Just just perfect for uh, for the coloring of it, for the the execution of it. Uh, yeah, look at that. That is just amazing. The, the just the, the artistry there is just amazing. Uh, the, of course, Ant Man going inside the Vision has nothing to do with the Kree Skrull War either. That's the whole thing about this this run is that it's false billing. It doesn't give us an intergalactic war doesn't even give us anything close to that. We get closer to that in one panel of one issue of Chris Claremont's X-Men than we do anywhere in this whole run of the Kree-Skrull War. But 
it fit with Booktube at War. <laughs> so this was the this was the military thing that I read that I reread last night. I'm not sure how many reads this Marvel's Finest still has in it, uh, but it's certainly in better shape than my original issues. I did like the story when it when it first appeared, but not because of the story it was purporting to tell, only because of uh, all of the side stuff. Like everybody else, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that Ant Man would fly around inside the Vision. Like everybody else at the time, I thought how great it is to see these old World War II era Marvel heroes back alive and fighting the bad guys. I, I loved it all. Um, so anyway, comic books, most famous war of the Stan Lee era. Of course, I am not of the Stan Lee era. I predate the Stan Lee era. So my favorite comic book war is Earth versus Krypton. But <laughs> we'll get to that at some future point. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now. Sorry to go on at such length, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Bluetooth.